Welcome everyone. We are super excited to have everyone join us today on our webinar uh, that is affectionately called our Tick Talk with Tim McDermott from OSU Extension. We are so thrilled to be giving an update on our webinar that we did last year. While we're waiting to have all of our attendees join, I'll just type a couple of things um, housekeeping into the chat. We are going to be using the Q&A function to ask questions. So if anything comes up as we're going along in the presentation, please feel free to type your questions or comments into the chat and we'll have plenty of time to get there at the end and, and go through as many of them as we can. Um, and if you do, um, see something, a question and answer, I think you can like elevate them. So maybe someone has already asked your question, um, but there's uh, no harm in putting whatever questions you have today. We will be recording today. So it is evergreen and you can be able to access this webinar afterwards um, on a couple of platforms. So you can watch it again and review and take extra notes. Um, so I am so thrilled to be here alongside Liz Whiting, uh, who is my colleague here at the Nature Conservancy in Ohio, and with Dr. Tim McDermott from OSU Extension. Uh, we are so thrilled to be learning more about ticks and how to keep ourselves safe this year. Um, I'm really excited to see what updates you have for us, Tim. So whenever you're ready, you can just go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Angie. Thank you so much for having me back. So we had done a uh, a tick update in fall last year. And then when we were making program plans over the winter, Angie was like, we need to have you back. And I was like, that sounds great to me because I know I'm going to have some new information to share. And then for anybody who was here before, there probably will be some similar slides. Uh, but when I went through veterinary school, what I was taught was clients won't remember what you have said to them until you said it at least three times. And so uh, we'll have at least one more tick webinar going on there. So I go all over the place in the state of Ohio, and we're going to be concentrating sort of on Ohio, Ohio Valley, but we're going to have a whole bunch of um, uh, updates in, in a lot of the United States because we have a lot of movement in ticks. And what I'm going to be doing is first off addressing the myths of ticks because I know a lot of people that are on this webinar grew up just like me. They grew up in the woods, and I grew up in the woods. My kids grew up in the woods, and, you know, we would get ticks on us, but back in the day, they were gross. You pulled them off, you squished them, but you didn't really think too, too much of them. And one of the things I want to stress is it is different now. It is different in Ohio now with a change occurring rapidly in just the last 10 years from the way it was. And so I need to really, as I go around, I need to address the myths that people have based on old knowledge so that they understand how much different it is now. And myth number one is that ticks are only actually Active in the summer. And while we will see, depending on tick species, increased activity, say from April through September, we have tick activity in Ohio with positive disease diagnosis every single month of the year. We have Lyme positives in January all over the state. And so you know, depending on your weather, there might be a day where it's super cold and, and you don't have very much tick activity at all, but then there's going to be a day where it warms up. I mean, we have days in Ohio in January and February in the 70s, and believe it or not, ticks will break hypobiosis and they will go out there and start causing problems. So realize that anytime you are outside, you have a potential to have a tick encounter. And then myth number two is that ticks prefer the woods. I will say that there are some species of ticks that are woods preferential ticks. A deer tick comes to mind, also known as the black-legged tick. The lone star tick would be one that would be woods preferential, but there are other tick species that are plenty happy in a meadow or a pasture or your backyard. Uh, things like the American dog tick and the Gulf Coast tick come to mind. And then myth number three is that it takes a full day of a tick being attached to its host in order to transmit disease. And that is information that came from the CDC with adult deer ticks, also known as black-legged ticks, 
transmitting Lyme disease to humans. And what we know now is there's lots of variables. One of the variables is the tick species. One of the variables is the disease. Another variable is actually what life stage the tick is. Is it a larval form, a nymphal form, an adult form? Because they can transmit at different times. And in fact, we are seeing things like Rocky Mountain spotted fever and anaplasma might be transmitted much faster than that. In the laboratory, Powassan virus was transmitted to mice by nymphal deer ticks in as fast as 15 minutes. And so the take home point that I tell people is this, and I say it honestly, although I know it might sound flippant. I want everybody on this webinar to never get bit by a tick again for the rest of their lives. Do everything that you can to prevent that. Okay, so we're going to take a little trip back in the Wayback Machine here in Ohio, which doesn't really go very far back, but I want to give you the order of how we have had ticks in, in Ohio kind of come to prominence. So when I was in veterinary practice 20 years ago, we had the American dog tick. And since that point, we have gone from one tick of medical importance to humans, companion animals, and livestock to five now adding two in the last couple of years. And I'd like to point out the finger right here because when we talk about ticks, they are tiny. They have different sizes in there. On the far right here is the Lone Star. And in the middle, you have the relatively larger sized American dog tick. But then a black-legged tick or deer tick, male and female is tiny, tiny, tiny. And then what I want to point out is this little rascal all the way at the left that looks tiny like a little freckle. That is a black-legged tick nymph. It is as small as a poppy seed. It is as tiny as the period at the end of a sentence. But it is as likely or maybe even more likely to vector disease to you, assuming it has disease in it, just because it's so small that you would not really detect that on a tick check. You're not going to find it on your animals, and you're not going to feel it crawling on you. And so... Um, Let's start going through the various tick species of medical importance that we have in Ohio and for the most part prominent in the entire eastern two thirds of the United States as well. So, like I said, 20 years ago, the first tick that I encountered in private practice was the American dog tick. Uh, this was not uncommon for us to find. And um, this is one, like I said, that is a little more, more preferential for an open habitat. The last two American dog ticks that were crawling on me were crawling on me in basically backyard lawns in the city of Columbus as I was sitting, one watching my kids swim at the pool, and the other was at a graduation party. And so when we look at the distribution on the left, I want you to kind of memorize this little line here, because this little line is really going to be showing up in all the ticks that I'm going to be talking about today. But then when you look at this area here, when we don't really see this as established tick habitats for a lot of the ticks I'm going to talk about, I have recently um, been doing some presentations with some colleagues out west, and what they're finding through citizen science with people submitting tick to them that they have found on them in various places out west is we we are finding pockets where ticks can exist where otherwise they would not have because maybe it was too arid we're definitely seeing tick expansion into different areas secondary to global climate change and then another thing we're going to talk about with ticks is they don't all transmit every disease they kind of have their favorites and when we talk about the favorite ones that that the um black-legged tick would or sorry, that the American dog tick would vector, uh, a big one that it's going to vector is Rocky Mountain spotted fever. All right, now we're going to go to the tick that currently occupies what I consider public enemy number one, and that would be the black legged tick, also known as the deer tick. This one was found originally for the first time in Ohio in 2010 in Coshocton County, which is in the eastern, sort of eastern central part of the state. Ohio State researchers have gone back to that farm every year, and we're still finding black-legged ticks with Lyme disease on that site. This is the one that I consider public enemy number one pretty much because of the litany of diseases that it transmits. It transmits a number of them, bacterial and viral. And this is one when, when we first saw it. So if we look at the map, Coshocton County is right here. This is a woods preferential tick. Its first, its first host that it really likes to feed on when it is a nymphal or larval stage is the white-footed mouse, which is a super common mammal in a lot of states, including Ohio. Then it moves up as 
as it as it grows to maybe an intermediate sized mammal and finally it's going to feed uh, on the deer where it gets its nickname as the deer tick this is one that when we look at the diseases boy we got some bad ones here anaplasmosis babesia this tick was just declared endemic in New England for Babesia. Uh, babesiosis was declared, declared endemic in New England through this tick. Um, and so that's not that's not good. But then we look at Lyme disease, which is just overwhelming in its uh, frequency. And then Powassan virus encephalitis is no joke in there. So when we look at 2019, we see that we have some pretty common similarities in the host range of the deer tick to the American dog tick. But again, we are seeing little pockets of positivity through citizen science being submitted as samples collected in these environments. So we're starting to see these ticks maybe find a little pocket of habitat that might be a little micro environment that they like, and then they can establish colonies there. And there are Pacific uh, deer ticks over there that do vector uh, Lyme disease as well. So that's the one that's been studied the most. We have had a lot of data collected because when it really erupted in, in frequency out in the East Coast in New England, they started to do a lot of um, data collection and research to figure out what the heck we have going on in here. And one of the things that really struck me in just the last few years as I do presentations on tick vector disease is how good ticks are at transmitting disease. And one of the ways and one of the reasons that they're so good at it is they live a really long time. Ticks live for years. I mean, when we think of how long a mosquito or, or any other arthropod that can vector disease, right? Let's look at mosquitoes. Let's look at, you know, even fleas. Any of those things are very short lived. They're, they're nowhere near years, but ticks will mature over multiple years. Like the normal life cycle of a deer tick is two years. And quite honestly, if there's not food around, or the environment is not, um, you know, conducive for them to emerge and feed, they will stay in hypobiosis and don't have to feed for months. So it can last longer than that. But we're starting to get really good information on deer ticks as we track them. So this is what the seasonality chart for Ohio looks like. And it really drives home the point that it is a 12 month process, especially with these ticks that can tolerate cold and deer ticks can tolerate a little bit of cold. You'll notice that it never goes to zero and you'll notice where we're at right now. OK, we are in April. We are in a spike in Ohio where we have high prevalence of adult deer ticks. And then, you know, when we think about summer, we're gonna have huge populations crop up of nymphs and then larval form as well. And so this is where we really have that risk of disease because we have the nymphal form in very high numbers and it is gonna be prevalent when people are out in the woods, quite honestly. So, um, you know, we're gonna talk about personal protective stuff there, but this graphic really drives home to me that we have a year long uh, seasonality that we're looking at. And then I just did a podcast for a uh, outfitter and hunting group the other day. And what I said to them that um, I don't know how much they appreciated, but you know, when we look at the adult deer tick spike that we see in the winter, this is corresponding to deer season. And so what I said to them was when you're out deer hunting, the deer ticks are out hunting you at the exact same time. Uh, and so it just really is something to keep in mind is, you know, there is really no seasonality in a lot of habitat that you would be out in um, and you can encounter a ticket about any time. So like I said, we have great data that we have uh, starting to trickle in, but I think we could do a better job with our data collection, quite honestly. We do have a reporting problem in certain places. So when I look at you know, the reported statistics, we're getting say 45,000 to 50,000 cases per year, but the CDC estimates that we underreport by a factor of 10. And in fact, you know, we have had two or 300 positive cases in Ohio in any given year. I was in Athens and I co-presented uh, or guest lectured to a class that was being hosted by uh, Athens County Public Health, and they knew of 100 positive cases they had in Athens. And so we, we know that we have a lot more going on in Ohio, and you can see that, right? You look at this razor line of the Pennsylvania uh, state line against Ohio, there's no reason ticks would stop going across the border right there. This just means we don't have as robust of reporting from um, you know, our positive cases as they would have in Pennsylvania. When we look at the map right here, 
when I am thinking of, say, where I see the most deer ticks, this is the cluster. It is the eastern central part of Ohio. Here's Coshocton County, but we have huge numbers in Harrison, Belmont, and and, and, Je and Jefferson, and Tusk, and Carroll. All of these places would be considered hotspots for deer tick, but you can see they're pretty much almost everywhere, and it wouldn't surprise me if they were in these counties. We just didn't have reports of them over there because there's no reason we wouldn't have deer there. We have deer in downtown Columbus. They're certainly going to find a, a home in, in the agronomic crop area of Ohio where we grow lots of deer food, corn and beans. And then this is one where I like to point this out, you know, for any parents that are on here, the number one and the number two cohorts for positive Lyme disease in Ohio are our kiddos five to nine and 10 to 14. Because think of, how, you know, think of what a kid's going to do. They're probably not wearing permethrin treated clothes. They're probably not putting a repellent on, or at least not reliably. They're going out, they're rolling around in the woods. They're not doing tick checks when they get back. They're probably not taking a shower. You know, when I was a nine-year-old boy, I probably showered once a week for about 30 seconds, and I certainly wasn't thinking about doing a tick check. But we need to make sure that we really do a good job identifying that this is a hole in our public health awareness. Our most impacted population um, is kids from 5 to 9 and 10 to 14. So we need to work to make sure that we're getting the word out that we need to increase our awareness of where our, our holes and our problems are. And then this was an interesting thing. This is uh, something that dropped into my Google feed where they had used metadata from studies over, involving over 150,000 people globally. And so that's a pretty large sample size. And what they're finding is based on that metadata, the estimates of the number of people that have gotten Lyme in North America is 9.4 out of 100, so nine and a half percent. In the world, they're thinking 14 percent of people. And that is just an absolute huge number. And that really drives home that how many people get this per year. We're seeing those numbers increase. We're seeing the, um, the number of positivity for those increase as well. All right, so I'm going to jump before we go in there. We got a chat and, and we got a QA. So let's see. How can we work together from anonymous attendee to get a Lyme disease vaccine for humans back on the market? It was seen as a yuppie thing. So anonymous attendee, I can tell you right now that there are Lyme vaccines for humans undergoing trials, um, and there will be Lyme disease uh, vaccines for people coming out. I don't have a time frame to share with you, but as we're going to talk about here in a minute, I don't want that to become your only tool in your toolbox. That is a great thing to prevent Lyme disease, but there's lots of different bad things that can happen from a, um, a tick attaching and feeding on you, and in case, uh, and in case you know, uh, folks would only think that if you got that vaccine, then you're good to go, um, then I would say not. All right. And then we have Elizabeth Save. I've had Lyme disease three times per at the fourth now. Yeah, these these are bacterial infections in, in a lot of cases, and you you don't generally get an immunity to it. Um, you can get it over and over again. All right. So let's talk about the Lone Star Tick, right? So we went to 2010 with Coshocton and our deer ticks. Now we're about 2014-15 or so in Ohio. I'm not really sure of the exact date because we don't have that, that you know, signal event like we had with deer ticks, but we started getting Lone Star Ticks in Ohio. They had migrated up from the south, and if we go back to that map right here, this is my Lone Star area in Ohio. Right here, heavily wooded. They are a woods preferential tick. I see them the most, depending on the Time of year, I'm going to see most of my lone stars on a tick dragger, or, or you know things like Jackson and and Vinton, and down in that southern wooded uh, Appalachian belt. Lone star ticks will vector disease, very similar to uh, the other ones that we've been talking about. But where lone star ticks can uh, affect people's lives is that there are some chemical similarities in the saliva of a lone star tick to some of the carbohydrates in non-primate mammalian muscle. And if you get bit by a lone star tick and your immune system negatively reacts to that, you can become allergic to non-primate mammalian muscle, which means you just became allergic to beef, pork, lamb, venison. Basically, you just got a uh, 
bacon cheeseburger allergy. And so, um, you know, if you have uh, bacon cheeseburgers, number one on your list of favorite foods, like I do, then this would be something that would be potentially devastating. And unfortunately, in that part of Ohio that I showed, that is where we do a significant amount of beef cattle grazing. And we have a number of beef producers in Ohio that are allergic to beef, and that really can affect their lives lifestyle. So a couple things to note, when we look at this map and we see the bottom part looks like the other maps we saw, you can extend it. We are seeing reports of Lone Stars up north here as they continue their movement. Um, to, the, to the person who had dropped in the chat about repeated exposures, a lot of people ask me, well, how long does that allergy last? And we don't really know. One thing about immune systems is they're very individual to the person and, and one person's immune system is different than another person's and how we react to stuff. But there is, um, they, they are hypothesizing that it would resolve slowly over time. Although if you continue to get bit by Lone Star ticks, you can continue to have high levels of allergy so that would be the that would be the recommendation would be, you know, we're talking about we don't want you to get bit ever. But if you get a bacon cheeseburger allergy and, and you have visions of that bacon cheeseburger in your future someday, then I would make sure that you would, um, you know, double down on your protection. All right. So now we have gone ticks one, two and three in Ohio. We're going to go to number four. And I've been doing tick presentations for a number of years. This one was on our radar. We saw it sort of making its way towards us here. The Gulf Coast tick um, is now established in Ohio. The Gulf Coast tick is not new to the United States. In fact, the Gulf Coast tick is actually been around for a long, long time. It was one of the very first ticks that was identified and studied scientifically way back in the 1800s. Um, this is one, as its name states, originally was from the Gulf Coast. Okay, This is one that has a couple of unusual things to it. One of those things is it uh, does have this monster hypostome. So this is, the, this is basically the piercing sucking mouth part of a tick. If you looked at it really carefully, you would see it has barbs on it. It's like a bunch of fish hooks or harpoons and that helps it holds on really well. This is one when it feeds, it can leave a really big feeding hole. And way back in the day, it was uh, complicit in the spread of, of screw worm, which is a federally reportable veterinary outbreak of a, a pest that um, can cause devastation in the livestock industry. And the feeding wounds from this tick back then caused lots of problems on it. So it does have its favorite diseases uh, that it can vector. Um, one of the ones that I'm really concerned about would be if it becomes a competent vector of leptospirosis here in Ohio, because leptospirosis is a zoonotic disease. And what that means is if the tick passes it on, say, to your dog or to cattle, then this is a parasite that gets excreted in bodily fluids, which means a human could become infected with lepto from the dog or the cow after the tick is long gone. That's what zoonotic means, transferred between species. So when we look at the habitat range for the Gulf Coast, it does look different. This is a tick that prefers a little more open habitat. Its original Gulf Coast habitat was coastal grasslands, and its original sort of habitat you can see would be right here from, you know, maybe the Carolinas and moving down to Texas. And then you see this little um, sort of extension of its habitat that goes into Arkansas and Oklahoma. And what happened was there was cattle shipments from Texas and down south in the 70s and 80s into those areas. And as ticks will do, because they're very adaptable to new habitat, if they find a place that's even halfway um, halfway welcoming to them in terms of what they need for shade or heat or relative humidity with food present, they will rapidly establish colonies there. And so then what we've been watching for the last you know, five, 10 years is it slowly made its way up the Ohio and the Mississippi River valleys. And now its habitat would be roughly uh, delineated by this uh, drawing that I did with my super awesome PowerPoint skills, which I do realize looks like a turtle um, crawling up the eastern half of the United States. But we do have that now uh, all the way up the coast. We found evidence of the Gulf Coast tick and where it is in Ohio. Um, it's in numerous counties in small numbers, but we have established colonies around Cincinnati. So in that area there. So that's one that we have to keep an eye on. 
So going forward now, I'm going to give you an update on uh, a tick that has really uh, exploded into Ohio in the last couple of years and really exploded into the United States in about the last five or six, and that is the Asian longhorn tick. So the Asian longhorn tick is a true invasive, and this tick was first discovered in uh, the fall of 2017 in New Jersey on a um, on a sheep on a farm in huge numbers, absolutely giant numbers on this farm, which is what really attracted the um, the veterinary community and the government to that because that's kind of unusual to see ticks in just explosive numbers on animals or in one space. And so um, what they found at that point was a tick that had become uh, established in the United States in large numbers. They did not find out how it got there. You know, when they checked the provenance of the animal or the travel of the family or the neighbors, they, they could not find any reason why it would be there. But since that point, it has really exploded. Now, when we take a look at this picture right here, I want to point out just how tiny this tick is. Okay. We knew that the deer tick, adult, ma female here, male here, and the um, the nymph here are very tiny, right? These are poppy seeds. And so that is a tiny little rascal right there. The Asian longhorn tick is another tiny, tiny tick. So it's not going to do its damage because it's huge. You can see it doesn't have a really big feeding hypostome, even like a deer tick does here. It does its damage because it can breed into overwhelming numbers. Some of the worries that we have about this tick is that in its native host range, it can vector many pathogens. Uh, some of them can cause devastating disease to people. It feeds on a tremendous number of hosts. It is, uh, and I'm going to show you the partial list that we found to date. Uh, and then where this tick is really a problem is this tick can reproduce via parthenogenesis, which means this tick uh, can reproduce with the female not needing a male to mate. She can spontaneously lay eggs. They are clones of her in very high numbers. And in fact, on that farm in New Jersey, they found that basically they were all clones. Males are rare. And that is huge because you just need one female to get somewhere, find a host and find a habitat. And then she can start laying eggs and colonize the space rapidly. And she doesn't lay them really quick. She'll lay them over several weeks. So it's not unusual to see multiple life stages at once in an area or on a host. And then this is a tick that does like the heat. It does like the humidity. This is one that really has decreased activity under 45 or 50 degrees. It's not like the deer tick out there. Uh, but when it gets the heat and it gets the, it gets the um, environment that it likes, it can actually do a pretty quick maturation through a life cycle and mature within a year, which is much faster. Um, but it needs, it needs it to be perfect to do so. So here is where we have this in Ohio. Um, what we started with was Gallia County uh, about, let's see, I'm going to say 2020, and we had maybe 2019. We had a tick that was um, sent to Ohio State that had been found on a dog at a rescue organization. There was a grant study going on where dogs all across Ohio that went through humane organizations, when they were examined by the staff, any ticks found on them were sent to Ohio State, and that was the first identification of the Asian longhorn tick in Ohio. And then the next spring, as I was talking to some researcher colleagues of mine, I said, hey, you know, we have a research station in Jackson County that um, raises beef cattle and small ruminants sheep there. And I'm like, in the spring, they're going to be working the animals. That would be a great opportunity for researchers to examine those to find ticks on the animals. And in fact, they did find a tick um, on the animals. I want to say that's probably 2001 now, and that would be in the spring. And um, we didn't see an outbreak, though. That was just a singular one. So then what we had in the summer of 2000 and um, 2021 was I got a phone call from a colleague of mine in Monroe County, which is over here, and he had uh, called because when his across the street neighbor who is a cattle uh, grazer and he's also a cattle grazer when he did a herd check on his animals, he found three dead animals and they were covered with ticks and he contacted me and I told him that sounded like the Asian longhorn tick so he sent ticks in and it was confirmed they were Asian longhorn and then researchers from OSU went out there to study the space. But that was a case where there was overwhelming numbers very similar to the farm in New Jersey, overwhelming enough that we had um, we had fatalities secondary to tick feeding. And then we go to um, last fall or last summer, um, we had large numbers of ticks on cattle in um, in Belmont County and in Morgan County, but both producers um, 
had actually attended talks that I gave in those counties and um, had been increasing the checking on their animals and were able to identify large numbers of ticks on the animals and work with their vet to get treatments for them. So we had no fatalities in there. And then in the fall, we had two, uh, number six and number seven's county. Guernsey had a sample sent much earlier um, and they identified a Asian longhorn tick that was submitted off a gray fox. And then where I'm at right now in Franklin County here, we had a tick submitted off of a human that found a tick crawling on them uh, as they were walking on a bike trail near Eaton. So we have seven counties positive. And as we warm up, remember this tick doesn't really like the cold. So all of the Asian longhorn ticks in Ohio right now are probably under some organic matter in a humidity zone that they find conducive to staying hydrated, waiting to emerge. And that's why I got a bunch of stars down at the bottom here to put them on the new counties that we get positives on going forward. Where the expansion has gone since 2017 from its original New Jersey over here is we now have Asian longhorn ticks in 18 states, and we'll probably add a few more going forward um, as we get some warm up in the weather. This tick is very mobile on wildlife, so when you look at the pattern of expansion, you can almost see as it's moving through the mountains here. And we see it in the mountains and, and we see it was in West Virginia and it probably crossed over the river. We we've never seen the river be any kind of barrier in the past to Asian longhorn tick expansion. And, and I don't see we're going to see that, but we have it in Ohio now uh, and see and we should, you know, probably expect future expansion uh, to other places because where we're seeing it is urban counties, rural counties doesn't really matter. We're seeing it in, in different environments. And then here's one of the worries that we have about this is it feeds on about anything. And in fact, we have found it on 11 avian species. And of those 11, roughly half are migratory waterfowl. So picture this tick being able to travel on a Canada goose because we have found it on Canada geese. It is um, one that if it catches a ride on a Canada goose somewhere, it might just land where it has a habitat that it can enjoy, and then we can have colony expansion right off the bat. And so, you know, I told you that we had first found it in 2017 in Jersey when they did go back and examine a bunch of samples that were submitted back in the day, then they did find that it had a positive on a white tiered white-tailed deer in 2010 and on a dog in 2013, but we didn't have the giant numbers in those cases. And we didn't have the giant numbers on every case in Ohio yet. We've had that three times. And part of the reason is, is the seasonality. But here is an example of just how high of a number that we can see. When my colleagues went to Monroe County to do a, um, a pasture check in the area where we had tick fatality, they do what's known as a tick drag. And what a tick drag is, is you basically lay down a square yard or meter of cloth, a measured amount, and that way you can take random samples and then you can extrapolate to a tick burden in a, a square um, area of measurement. But they did, they walked right in the gate and they dropped a square yard of cloth down and they did a tick drag and, and that's usually some kind of cloth that's grabby. Then you pick the cloth up and you run the cat hair lint roller over it and see if you got lucky. And in Monroe County, what they found was every dot on this is an Asian longhorn tick. You have two adults and the rest are all nymphs. And there's thousands on this roller and that extrapolated to millions in the pasture. And in fact, the animals that were left in the herd were tested for disease and they were disease negative. And so the working diagnosis is those ticks overwhelmed those animals um, in sheer numbers with blood feeding. And those were full grown animals. That was uh, two mature cows in their bull. Although we do know that this tick can cause uh, fatality in calves in as little as five days from blood feeding. So one of the things that we are finding out as we, doing, as we do research, because I work with a lot of producers and, and livestock folks, and, and I need to help them keep their herds tick safe, that this tick really does have a seasonality. Okay, I showed you that chart from the deer tick. This is the chart from the Asian longhorn tick, but this is the Rutgers chart in Jersey. We're seeing with ours that it's probably shifted a little bit because where we have seen tremendous numbers of ticks on animals in Ohio is in July. It is super hot. It is super humid. They love that. And then 
in each of these situations, the animals went into ideal tick habitat, which was long grass. So the ticks can go up and find the animals in the heat, but then when they have a blood meal, they can fall down into the grass with high humidity and high heat and they can breed. So all three of these were when animals were rotated into that last pasture and, and you know, we had had good rain in those times. So the pastures had not gone dormant yet. So we had grass growing and the animals went in there. And especially the one in Monroe County, the grass was hyper mature. Uh, those animals went into situations where there was just so many ticks in there that they instantaneously colonized the animals. And so as I um, create outrage materials for for grazers or, or just people that are going to go into any potential habitat. You know, this is a tick. The Asian longhorn tick likes the heat. It definitely has a humidity level that it prefers. Um, and if it has that excellent for it environment, it can breed in tremendous numbers. And so, you know, that's one of the things as we're developing is we probably shift our spike of May closer to that July, where we would have an overlap of nymphs and adults when it's in high heat. And then, um, you know, we had, we had still seen larval activity as to October 16th. Um, but then once it starts getting cool, they start to calm down a little bit. So then what we worry about is what can this tick actually vector here? Because not every tick vectors every disease, and we don't know if it is going to be competent to vector diseases here. So there's a lot of studies going on trying to do PCR testing of ticks collected in the field or within the laboratory so we can identify what they can do. And so in the field, they've collected Asian longhorn ticks and then got PCR test positive for Thyleria orientalis, which is a protozoal disease affecting cattle, Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme, Anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is the human variant of anaplasmosis, and then Bourbon virus. But in the in the laboratory, we find that it can vector Rickettsia rickettsii, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and then we have Thyleria, and we have had a positive case of Thyleria transmission in Ohio. That was in Monroe County, where a cow was diagnosed by their veterinarian with thyloid Thyloritis. That's the only disease in Ohio that we have verified at this very minute that this tick can vector. So we might have found, say, Lyme disease within the tick, but we're not finding Lyme disease is actually transmitted by this tick, which is good. We're finding anaplasma. Uh, phagocytophilum is within the tick, but in laboratory, it's showing it's not competent to vector that. And hopefully that does not change. And then a worry would be, you know, Let's go back to bacon cheeseburgers. You can tell I haven't had my dinner yet. The um, uh, there is uh, this tick is endemic in parts of Asia now, and it's it's in endemic in Japan. And they're finding that in an area where there's very high populations of the Asian longhorn tick, that they're seeing that mammalian muscle allergy. And so I guess that would be a worry that this tick would actually be able to induce that allergy in susceptible people who might have that allergic response to the bite. And these are all up to date as of uh, 2023 at the Asian uh, Longhorn discussion on the monthly National Cattle Tick Zoom. All right, so then we model. Where can this rascal live? Um, and as I stated, it does like the heat. So when we look at this model, we see that there's some light tan, and that's where one model agrees. And then butterscotch is where two models agree. And then where it is bright red, all three of the predictive models um, agree that this tick is going to live. And, and you can see that that is more uh, southern and hot and humid, but some coastal stuff that stays warm enough and humid. But then if we were to really look close to Ohio, we would notice Notice that only two of the models have agreed that this part of Ohio can be a home for this tick, and we've already seen this tick there. So the tick evidently is not reading the journal articles or, or following the laboratory research, unfortunately. And then um, we did come out with a fact sheet, and uh, Angie will dump that into the chat as well as that will be in the follow-up email, what we're knowing about the Asian longhorn tick now. And then I am uh, working on a publication designed to assist our producers keep their animals tick safe as well. Okay, so I know I get a little spooky there for a while, and I am sorry about that. Um, I like to, as I say, mildly to moderately terrify the audience because I really want this to um, hit home because I might not be able to get this in front of you three times, and so I might need to hit this on the first time. So correct removal of a tick. There is one way, and that is with a tick tool or pointy tweezers to get all the way to the head so that you get the mouth parts that are embedded out as well and go straight up 
and then wash that space and wash your hands. The tick can go into a plastic bag with hand sanitizer in there for submission, either for identification um, or for tick testing at a lab for pathogens. And then I recommend folks, if you've had a tick embedded in you, contact your physician in case they want to uh, think about doing some treatment and, and they can give you counseling on the symptoms and stuff to watch out for. Don't just grab it by its tick butt though, because you will yank that up. You'll probably rip the butt off. You'll probably squeeze the gut contents into you and make you sicker. And don't like put a match on it or something hot uh, for the same reason. It'll probably make you sicker. There actually are research publications showing improper removal of a tick is associated with a higher r risk of disease. And then I like to show people what I would consider sort of the habitat modifications in, say, your basic backyard, knowing where ticks are, because there's only a small percentage of them are going to live right where the bright, sunshiny uh, lawn is in the middle there, only like 2%. And ticks don't spend a lot of time on the animals because we're, we're the restaurant, not the hotel. Where they like to go is they need that humidity zone, right? They can tolerate, even the ones that tolerate the sun better need to find some place that's got some humidity so they don't desiccate. So what I like to point out is, you know, a significant chunk of ticks are going to be within three meters on either side of that edge habitat where their humidity zone is. So if you got the woods behind your house here, then, you know, if you got a wood pile or you got a leaf pile, you're going to have a humidity place where ticks could, could possibly persist. And, you know, when you're citing your stuff, like, don't put the swings out where the kiddos are going to be right up against the woods or else they're going to be in prime tick habitat. Bring that a little bit further away in there. And same thing with your, your vegetable garden. Don't put it right next to the woods. Make those groundhogs and deer have to walk at least you know 10 or 20 feet to eat all your vegetables. Don't give them uh, an easier time of it. And then I've even seen where a barrier like gravel or mulch would go down in order to have sort of a mechanical barrier to keep ticks from where the people are, so they stay where the where the uh, prime habitat for them would be. And then understand that if you go into that habitat, you're you're in their habitat there. And I'm not trying to dissuade people from going into the woods. I just want to help everybody keep tick safe. I still go hiking and and do all those things, but I'm not crawling through the honeysuckle bush all the way down to the you know like I was when I was a kid making a fort doing stuff like that. Just understand your risks are a little bit bigger now. Okay, and now. What we want to do is we want to talk about armoring up a little bit. I recommend permethrin treated clothing. You can self treat if you follow the label. Remember to read, understand, and follow the label of your permethrin product that has to be by federal law labeled for use on fabric. Or you can make it even easier on yourself and just purchase pre treated clothing because any number of outfitters now are going to sell permethrin treated clothing. And the nice thing is permethrin bonds to fabric. So it will uh, stay present for multiple washings. Um, and then I say you have your clothes, long pants, light colors, so you can see the tick on there. I also like to couple that with topical repellents. That means they go on your skin. And I don't. Um, I don't give any one specific recommendation. What I tell folks is be a label reader. There's lots of stuff out there. It needs to be labeled for ticks. Not all of them are. Some of them might have a mosquito label and some of them might have mosquito and tick. Make sure you get one with a label. Remember to read, understand, and follow the label. The label is the federal law. And then make sure what you're picking is appropriate for your situation, right? Some of them might be labeled for use on kids. Some of them might have sunscreen. Some of them might have different lengths of time. They're applicable on them. Uh, DEET, Picaridin, and IR3535 are available out there now. And then the FDA did uh, give recent approval for a, a essential oil, Nutcatone, and so we should look to have a new product, which is exciting because we don't always have a bunch of new products coming our way. All right, and then take homes are this. Tick diseases are prevention diseases. I really, really mean it when I say I don't want any of you to get bit by a tick ever, okay? Your best sort of IPM strategy is going to have multifactorial, but but Number one is going to be public health awareness. You now know you can encounter a tick outside in any habitat, any time of the year. And then stay up on the new research. There is constant changing research on ticks. We are studying them in more detail now, trying to learn how to keep ourselves tick safe. Know that they can vector or transmit bacterial, viral, protozoal disease. If they have it in them, they can't vector it if they don't. But they can also 
bite you. And if your immune system reacts negatively, you could have an allergic reaction to non-primate mammalian muscle. Make that personal plan for safety. That is your permethrin tree to close. That is your repellents. That is your long pants. That is knowing how to remove it correctly. That is doing a tick check. That is coming in from being out in tick habitat and tossing the clothes in the washer or running them in the dryer for a little while to drive everything so that you can desiccate them. And then Make sure you understand that your companion animals can break biosecurity. Our four-legged friends do not do tick checks, but they are tick magnets in tick habitat. So work with your veterinarian to get the best product that you can fit in your budget uh, to keep your four-legged friends tick safe. And on that note, I am done. So I'm going to let Angie do her housekeeping, and then we'll stay and take some questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Tim. You definitely deserve a little water break right now. That was so much information and a lot to update us on. I really love how you end and drive home the take homes for us. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Please keep them going. Um, as we finished up here, we have plenty of time to answer what's going on. One of the things that I definitely have to recommend myself too is I think my whole world changed when I found how to properly treat my clothes with permethrin. I not only felt safer, I I was safer and I can I can have my own personal accounts that it has made a difference because I am out in nature a lot, especially in those forested habitats down in our southern Ohio preserves that we have. So it's always good to be uh, on the lookout. If you are hiking or enjoying nature with a buddy, I always like to just say, let's look at each other and see if some freckles move just for a little bit when we're done with the day. I really like your suggestion of the lint roller too. Um, there's so many things that we can do and thank you for giving us those resources. And I want to be part of your group that doesn't get ever bit by a tick again, because I definitely got bit last summer and it was not a fun journey. So I, um, I welcome everyone to, you know, come and access the recording, take your notes if you haven't, but ask your questions now. Um, towards the middle of the presentation, we had an anonymous attendee ask, um, do you have to be bit each time or can you get flare-ups after treatment? I think that might have been to Lyme disease. Anonymous attendee, if you can clarify that for us, that would be great. Sure, and I'm going to jump in and start progressing through these. So anonymous attendee, do you have to bit bit each time or can you get flare-ups after treatment? Um, you know, it's really individual to people. It, it, it's very difficult to predict how people are going to react to different diseases. So I know that... Um, that there can be some difficulty uh, diagnosing and treating Lyme disease. And uh, I do know that uh, the literature that I've seen for mammalian muscle allergy is that it might start to wear off uh, or wane slowly over time and then getting re-exposed to that could cause an allergy flare up. So Kathy asks, what infections do ALT transmit? So right now, the only positive uh, disease that we have for Asian longhorn tick in Ohio is Thyleria orientalis, the Ikea varit. Uh, variety of that, which is a protozoal parasite that causes disease in cattle. Uh, we have not had positive confirmation of disease vectored from an Asian longhorn tick uh, outside of that one, but we are keeping track of that stuff. So Elizabeth shared some uh, of her experience there, and thank you for sharing that, Elizabeth. Um, and if you guys want to take a look at that, what I would say is uh, just kind of to reinforce what Elizabeth said, if you are concerned about tick vector disease, make sure that you are an advocate for yourself with your physician because we are finding that depending on where they practice, we have higher or lower positivity rates. So when I did a program over in Tuscaroras County uh, last year, one of the people that co-presented on the panel with me was a physician. And he had great awareness of tick vector disease in his county because his county is a white hot region for it. In fact, there was an experiment going on where uh, one of the science teachers at the high school, uh, he's doing a dynamite job. He takes his students out and they do tick drags in various parts of Tuscaroras County and they are charting the hot spots in there. And uh, they had some places with over 90% positives. And what we're seeing in Ohio right now, depending on the county, the positivity rate of ticks carrying disease is close to 40 to 60%. And so if you have a tick embedded on you, you have an odds on chance that you would have had disease transmitted for you. And I would say that if you have found that you don't get the response that you would like out of your physician, um, be persistent because you are the advocate for yourself that way. 
And then Kathy says, should one put the repellents under clothes, on the skin, or only on exposed skin? Um, you know, Kathy, I have not seen specific guidance that way. I would use what you are comfortable with. If you want to put repellents uh, under your clothes, as long as you are following the label on them, that's great. I do know that uh, a lot of colleagues of mine will actually do uh, taped seams of their pants uh, where they have the pants meet the um, socks and that provides a barrier that way. Um, and then they have these really cool tick gaiters that I've seen that a lot of people that I've talked to swear by that that slides up and then it provides that barrier between the um, where there wouldn't be a tick that could get under the pants or something and start walking up that way. All right, and that says if I find a tick in the house brought in by my pet, can it still bite me or did it fall off because it's dying? Hard to say. It could be either of those things. It would really depend on what product your pet was protected by uh, that you're keeping on it, you know, whether it's the collars or the pills or the drops. And it would depend on um, did it fall off after feeding? Is it going to lay eggs? Did it ride in and fall off and it's still viable looking for a host? Um, it, it could be any number of scenarios. So anonymous attendee says, honestly, I hate ticks. What positive things do they contribute to our ecosystems? Is there anything good about them? And quite honestly, that's a great question. I would, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure there's something, right? Because everything is supposed to has a benefit in there. One of the things I get questions on a lot is what eats these ticks? Because if you have a, an explosion of a food product in a certain ecosystem, logic tells me that you would have an explosion of something that would eat them for a food. You know, and I, I go to the example of the uh, Lake Erie water snake, which was endangered. And then we had the invasive goby um, population explode in the lake. The endangered water snake eats them. And in fact, with that huge amount of easy to catch food out in that area, what we found is those populations stabilized. But I'm not seeing that with ticks. And I think probably one of the reasons is the explosion of ticks into new habitats and, and new high populations and high positivity rates of disease has been so fast. Literally in Ohio, we've gone from one tick of medical importance 20 years ago to five now, two in just the last few years, four of them in roughly the last dozen years. And so uh, anonymous attendee confirmed Lyme disease. Yeah, um, you know, that's a tricky one because Lyme disease is is proving that we need to do more research on that because we are seeing diff different people react differently after they're getting bit in terms of the presentations of disease in them. And they can present multifactorially. Um, they can hit any number of different organ systems because of their intracellular nature. And then Pete asks, seems like wearing rubber boots keeps them from latching on. Can you confirm that? Um, I would say, Pete, that, you know, uh, that would be a good protective barrier. I would say that it probably would not necessarily um, take to permethrin because if you were putting permethrin on there, uh, it wouldn't be, you'd need to have a permethrin product labeled for use in rubber if you wanted to treat. But rubber is a pretty impervious thing and it, it's not an easy thing to get a perch on. So maybe it's mechanical um, barrier as well as it's sort of slipperiness is working in your favor that way. Yeah, I've actually found that in my travels is that if I do all the right things, treat all the right clothes, it just seems like I have less of a mommy when I'm wearing those rubber boots and leading some of those hikes. So I think it might be that mechanical, like you suggested, but I've kind of anecdotally felt that way too sometimes, but was just thinking they couldn't grab on. Yeah, I, I think that each person sort of needs to evaluate their situation individually in terms of their family, their animals, their 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 habitat, their um, you know their lifestyle. That way, what I want to stress is, come up with some plan for yourself. Make sure you have a plan. That plan needs to have some level of protectance, repellence, involved biosecurity, understanding of habitat. Um, you know, veterinary care, you name it. Just like I said, go out of your way, prioritize making sure that you do not get bit by a tick ever for the rest of your life. Because unfortunately, so many of the diseases that they can vector or the allergies that can be caused by them can be devastating to you. We had one more come in through the chat and I have a question after that one. 
So Kathy asked, is spraying DEET into boots or clothes help? Uh, so Kathy, uh, using DEET in a manner inconsistent with its label, which uh, would probably mean spraying onto boots or clothes, would be a violation of federal law. Um, and so I cannot recommend that. And I would say that you're better off with using permethrin labeled for that and using your topicals in the, in the manner that they're uh, labeled for use as well. All right. So my question is, is I've been in situations before where I have felt a tick on me and I know it's attached. A little bit of panic sets in. I'm alone. It's the back of my neck. I can't see it. What do you recommend we do in that situation when we wait to try to get to someone to properly remove it or possibly improperly remove it? It feels like an impossible situation. It is, buddy. I would say <laughs> that, um, you know, your best thing is to to try to get it off the right way because there's no great way to answer it. There's one great way to take it off. And then I used to say this in private practice. There's, you know, there's there's one right way and then there's every other way. And so I would I would rather you figure out how to get it off the right way because I would hate to say, well, just grab it and yank it off. And, and then you would potentially worsen the disease. So um, mm -hmm. No great answer. You know, they make these tick removal tools now that you can put just on your keychain so you have them there. And then I guess I would say make sure you hike with that special someone who has no problem checking you for ticks um, before you uh, before you get out of that habitat. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You definitely had some compliments come in as well, Tim. Such a great presentation. We're going to put a link to the um sheet the fact sheet one more time into the chat um, for those of you who attended and those who couldn't attend uh, you will be having a recording link being sent out within the next day directly to your email you registered with and again tim we're going to have to invite you back we're going to have to get that three times a charm right for our tick talk with tim which is really a tongue twister that i enjoy saying um so I just want to thank you again for all the information. I feel better prepared going out there this spring, getting into nature and having a great time. I just want to thank you so much uh, for all the information and always for coming to us with some real solutions and some real information that can help us stay safe. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Have a great time, everyone.